is the last Sanskrit Shringar Kavya of Krishna Shringar. After that, there is no more Sanskrit Kavya at all. And Bhanudat has to be remembered or celebrated as an important Shringar Kavi because he introduces for the first time what is called Nayak Naika Bhed, the many kinds of Naikas, the Ashta Naikas of Bharata, which are only eight, now become hundreds upon hundreds of Naikas in every different situation of love. And Bhanudat was responsible for doing that, for creating all these different Naikas. And Bhanudat's Rasa Manjari, for some unknown reason, became extremely popular in the state of uh, Basholi and Nurpur in the Himalayan kingdoms, where it was painted. And this painting is a painting by an artist called Kripal from, uh, from Nurpur and Basholi, those kingdoms. And we heard Dr. Goswami the other day uh, describe this beautiful set of paintings, where uh, these paintings were uh, were developed. So Rasa Manjari is our last poet writing in Sanskrit, although we've had Vidyapati uh, in the middle. So then, of course, we come to Riti Kavya, which I've spoken about, that developed in the Rajput courts. It was courtly poetry, it was mannered poetry, stylized poetry, where Krishna and Radha were the courtly Naik and the courtly Naika, and their the entire patronage of the Rajas would come in. Jaidev did not have a patron as we know. There were no patrons in the Bhagavad. There are no patrons in Pushtumak Vaishnavism, only Vithilnath and Balabachari and so on. But now Krishna Shringar develops under the patronage of kings, the royalty and the nobility of the Rajput courts of Rajasthan and uh, the Bahari kingdoms. And this whole tradition, as I said, that happened in Orcha, where the poet would sit and sing, uh, the dancer would dance. In, in, in Keshav Das's case, uh, uh, Rai Parveen, who was the dancer, the wife of, uh, of King Indrajit. And the librarian would write, the painters would see, the paintings would be offered to the king for the king to see, and the king would either approve or not approve of paintings and so on. And this entire love was set in a courtly ambience, not in the pastoral Vrindavan. This Pranay Mandapa of Mujiti Kavya was an ornate place with uh, unguents and pastes and flowers and scents and perfume and music and rich textiles and so on. That's the description in Riti Kavya, which was transformed, of course, into paintings. Uh, and for 200 years, or almost 300, from 1592 onwards, this entire tradition of Riti Kavya continues with poets like Keshav Das and Bihari and Sundar and Matiram and Gang and so many hundreds upon hundreds of poets enjoying uh, Krishna Shringar in a courtly setting. Keshav Das also writes in the painting on the right side is from what is called the Kavi Priya, where Keshav Das writes, he converts Shringar on the pattern of Kalidasa's Ritu Sambhar, if you like, where Keshav Das talks about each month and talks about what, why the, the Naika says, please don't leave me in the month of Chaitra, because Chaitra is so beautiful. And if you leave me in Chaitra, I'll be so desolate without you. And he goes through all the 12 months of the year. And that is patterned on the whole Baramasa tradition. The Baramasa tradition, as you know, is a, the women's love songs of the absent husband. Uh, when the woman is alone and the husband is not there, she sings these sad, poignant songs of the absent husband. And Keshav Das picks up on that and composes Kavi Priya, the entire Paramasa. Each in itself, one can spend in a lot of time talking about that. Now, amongst the various Naikas, from the Ashta Naikas of Bharata, we now have hundreds upon hundreds of different Naikas. 
But the one Naika that is extremely powerful, poignant, and sensuous and important is what is called the Abhisarika Naika. The Abhisarika Naika, the Naika on this side, who leaves her home in the middle of the night to meet her beloved. She braves storms, thunder, lightning, snakes will wind around her feet, there are ghosts in the trees, but she's not deterred. She looks back, obviously talking to somebody, saying, I'm not going to be deterred. I'm on my way to meet my beloved and I'll meet my beloved at any cost. The Abhisarika Naika, one of the most poignant and the most beautiful Naikas in the entire Naika play, and painted and written by all kinds of artists. This is Bihari in his Satsai. Bihari in his Satsai also captures the same Krishna Shringa uh, in his own way. And in this particular episode, uh, people in the house say, ever since Radha has come into the house, we have to walk around with a panchang or an almanac. We don't know what data it is, because Radha is so beautiful, it's like having a full moon every day in the house. <laughs> So these are the kind of idioms they use to express love and beauty and so on. An important poet and king, who is a very important part of Krishna Shangar, is the Raja, Sansar, uh, Raja Savan Singh of Kishangar. Raja Savan Singh of Kishangar, 18th century, is an important uh, king and an important poet. He is the poet, he is the king of Kishangar. And his mother brings a dancer from Delhi into his court. And she was a very beautiful woman who had a beautiful voice. And she would dress well and sing well and herself write poetry. And, uh, and uh, Savan Singh falls in love with her and calls her Bunny Thani, the one who's always so well dressed. And then, of course, they marry and the Kishangar abdicates his throne, goes to Mathura spends the rest of his life writing Krishna poetry along with Bani Thani. The important controversy again here is that if you talk to His Highness the Maharaja of Kishanar, and I have spoken to him on two different separate occasions, and every time I bring up the question of Bani Thani, he gets so angry. He says, this is not Bani Thani, he will say. So then I said, pray, tell me, um, what shall we call this particular woman? painted by an artist called Nihal Chand, who makes his very beautiful fish-like eyes. These are called Kishangar eyes. Talking of eyes, how did Nihal Chand develop these eyes of this beautiful woman? It is said that Savan Singh, who was a Pushtimak Vaishnava, he wrote a number of poems upon the eyes of Srinathji. The eyes of Sri Nathji, there were no eyes because that, that Murti didn't have eyes and eyes had to be created. And Vithal Nath creates this eyes of Sri Nathji based on his fourth son who had very beautiful eyes. And silver craftsmen were called to create the elongated eyes of Sri Nathji that you saw based on Vithal Nath's fourth son. In Savant Singh, several hundred years later, writes many, many poems on the eyes of Sri Nathji. And Nihal Chand copies this and takes this and puts it on the eyes of this Naika, whom we normally call Bani Tani, but the edges, His Highness will not accept that. It is the contention of His Highness, and if any one of you are in Kishanga, you go and meet him. He likes meeting people. The only thing is he charges 500 rupees to, to meet him. That is his economic status as a moment. But if you meet him and pay your, your 500 rupees and you ask him about Bani Tani, so there's only one painting of Bani Tani which he has, which he will not show anyone. So then my repeated question when I go down on my hands and knees is, what shall we call this particular woman of which there are so many paintings in all museums and all collections. He says, for God says, call her the Radha of Kishangar and not Bani Tani. That's what he says. So, talk to him sometime if it's worth going and chatting with him. He's a nice person. So, here is another important development. 
where an actual person, a historic person, Bani Tani is not a mythic woman, she's an actual historic woman who came from Delhi to Kishanga, now becomes Radha and um, uh, Savan Singh becomes Krishna. So here is a transformation of human beings into Radha and Krishna for the first time as far as we know in, in ancient and medieval India. That is why this is an important step. One last or two last steps in Krishna Shingar before we end and that is the so-called Muslim Vaishnavas. There were poets in the 19th century in Mathura as well as Bengal, two parts of India, where Muslims were touched by Krishna Shingar and they wrote beautiful, evocative, sensuous poetry of the love of Radha and Krishna. That one such person was Ras Khan. Ras Khan was an Afghan who comes to Mathura and falls in love with his entire Krishna Shringar ethos of Mathura and writes beautiful poetry. And he says, I was looking for Krishna all over Vrindavan, but I did not find Krishna anywhere. I searched all the lanes and the, the Nikunjas and the gullies of Vrindavan. I did not find Krishna anywhere. But I found Krishna finally in the little forest grove and he was painting the feet of Radha. This is Raskhan. Raskhan writes many, many, many songs. And Raskhani songs are still sung by many people. Uh, they're still very, very popular and they're very beautiful. Another poet in Odisha called Banmali Das. Uh, Banma, uh, Odisha also has a very rich tradition of Krishna Shangar. And Banmali Das is another poet who is popular especially with dancers and Odissi dancers. Many of them is, uh, will dance to the compositions of Banmali Das. And in this particular composition, Radha is asking her gopis, her friends, saying, do you know who this person was who just came and left? So the friends say, of course we know, it's another one of our uh, uh, Sakhis, a woman friend who comes and who was with us for a while. And Radha says, well, you don't know who he was. He was Krishna who came in the guise of a, of a Sakhi. Mm -hmm. So she, they go, these, these people ask, how do you know he was Krishna? Uh, Radha says, look at my feet. He's written his name on my feet without. So these are the little fragments of love that go on. This is Banmali Das in Orissa. And the final phase, if you like, of Krishna Shankar, as it ends in this, the 20th century, are what are called Khayal Bandishas, where these fragments of romantic Krishna poetry are incorporated in classical Hindustani music. And the champion of this particular form of Khayal Bandish was uh, Adharam and Sadara, two musicians in the court of Mamad Shah Rangila, where these compositions of Krishna Shangar become a part of Hindustani classical music. And it is said today that 90% of Khayal Bandishis are based on Krishna Shangar, of different, of Koli, of this and that and so on. So Khayal Bandish, then another very important part of Krishna Shangar and how it is kept alive. And that brings us to modern Hindi poets like Dharambir Bharati, uh, who is the editor of Dharmayu, who writes a very beautiful poem called Kanupriya, in which he talks about Radha and Krishna and so on. And then, of course, we come to this modern period. Today is Radha and Krishna. And there I'd like to raise a question, if I may, that these modern poets, whether in Bollywood or in the Bhashas, are they the same, are they to be considered the same level as Jaydev and the poets of the Bhagavad or Vidyapati or Keshatas? Are they Krishna Bhaktas as these other poets were or do they just write romantic poetry and call it Krishna poetry? I don't know the answer. My personal prejudice, if you like, view is that these modern poets are not true Bhaktas in that sense and they write Krishna love poetry. Uh, in sort of Bollywood style. 
what you call Gulzar a Krishna Bhakta, I don't know, in my many discussions with him, uh, he doesn't come through as a Krishna Bhakta as far as I'm concerned. Although he writes such beautiful songs of Radha and Krishna and so on. So that's a question for you to think about, whether these modern poets are Krishna Bhaktas or not. So on that note, we end up a journey of Krishna Shrangar, which began much before the Bhagavad. We talked about the Bhagavad and then we went into Pushtumag Vaishnavism and then we met of course Jayadeva who transforms the entire Krishna Shrangar with the introduction of Radha. And then we bypass Chaitanya, although we meet in the middle uh, Vidyapati and uh, Bhanudat. And finally end the glorious period of Riti Kavya, which incidentally is written in Braj Bhasha and not Sanskrit. Braj Bhasha is particularly suited for Krishna Shrangar as opposed to Sanskrit. Sanskrit is majestic but stays distant. It doesn't have the earthy sensuality of Braj. And Braj is easily sung rather than even though it is written. Because in my work in the Braj, literature of Krishna Shangar, every time I had a problem and I would approach a professor of Braj and I would say, can you help me with this particular pada of either Kesha Das or behind you or whatever. They would say, leave it with me, I'll have to sing it and then I'll tell you what it means. See, just reading it doesn't make any sense. Which brings out another very important idea of Krishna Shangar. That Krishna Shangar, even as Krishna says in the Bhagavad, has to be synesthetic. Synesthetic meaning, Krishna Shangar has to be enjoyed and celebrated through all the arts together, through poetry, through singing, through dancing, through painting, through folk art, through food, and so on. That is how Krishna Shangar has to be enjoyed, not just by reading poetry in a quiet corner of your room. That is not how Krishna Shangar has to be enjoyed. It is synesthetic meaning it has to be enjoyed with all the arts coming together and in a group of people who can then enjoy and help each other even take the enjoyment even further. That is how Krishna Shankar has to be enjoyed. So on that note, I'm going to stop my little talk. Thank you for listening to me. And if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yes, Alpha, Andal I spoke about. But 
and there is a beautiful tradition of Tanjore art which celebrates Krishna. Correct. So, that uh, point of In fact, I'm right now working on a 200-year-old manuscript in the time of Sarfoji yes. called Radha Krishna Sambha. Oh, it's wonderful. written in old Marathi with Telugu in it. Right. And Sudha yes. is helping me with that to translate from old Marathi to new the Marathi. The translator is Telugu. Apparently, the Marathi of Tanjabur in those days was mixed with Telugu. So I'm told. I don't know how to buy it. Because there were nine rulers. There were nine rulers. There were nine rulers. There were nine rulers. Yes. But why Telugu and not Tamil? I don't know. Because Tanjabur was the classical Sarkhan. It was a Marathi in those days. In fact, Sarkhan started schools where the five languages were taught. Which had even Arabic and uh, Telugu, Sanskrit. And Telugu is the language of the courts. Oh, I see. The way Persian has status. Interesting. Telugu has status. Is there only Bada Krishna? Bada Krishna? No, but that's only Bada Krishna. Bada Krishna. Okay, but the Shridhari Krishna of the Radha Krishna that I've been talking about is mostly in northern and western India and a little bit in Bengal. Maharashtra Dagadansa Desha. <laughs> <laughs> so there is no uh, No, I, uh, from what I understood from your own lecture, uh, Radha is a recent uh, sort of introduction. And perhaps it is only the popularity of that poet and in what states spread, what do you spread? You now see Radha and something in your own. Yes. Very little beyond You see a person movie. called Nipinai mm -hmm. uh, in the south. Yeah who is sort of a proto-Radha, but not actually a Radha. Uh, but there are many unanswered questions, and the one about the absence of Radha Krishna and Maharashtra sort of puzzles me. Uh, why only Bada Krishna and not Radha Krishna, I don't know. And of course, if you talk about, if you ever ask yourself, uh, I feel a little sad. Why did Radha not marry Krishna? If, if you ever ask that question, <laughs> then you have not understood this lecture. Yeah. <laughs> because the entire Shringar of Radha Krishna is Kavya Maya. There is, it's not a narrative. It is not a story. There is no history in it. If I make the Krishna Radha story a narrative, then there is a beginning and there is an end. And then Krishna and Radha will die. The love of Radha and Krishna is eternal and must remain wrapped in poetry, where there are no questions, just as when we talked about that beautiful woman who was pouring water <coughs> to the tired traveler. We didn't ask, what is your name, and did you marry, or did you not marry, or whatever. <laughs> we enjoyed that moment. So Radha Krishna love and Radha Shiva has to be enjoyed for just for that moment. And no historical questions, no social reality should be about it. But, but I want to posit a theory that it is music which uh, decides the spread. Okay. The spread? Yes. So, uh, if you look at Bhakti tradition of Maharashtra, then the music that is composed in that tradition has a certain, uh, the Pandalpur pilgrimage, etc. Right? Yes. Huh? Yes. So, all of it refers to a particular uh, sort of version of Krishna. In, I come from Kerala, our family deity is Guruvayur which is baby Krishna. Now that's it, that's the peculiarity of that shrine. Correct. Right? Same way in Maharashtra, the version that is popular is what the Bhakti sings. Absolutely. Hence Radha did not speak. It is what you sing. I agree that a certain ethos develops and then it stays. Uh, and that is why you don't see that. That is only either Rukmini and Vithal or only Bada Krishna and so on. And, and I think music has a uh, uh, poetry to do, what is written and what is sung in that temple and such yes. will determine that. And also the patron, I think, played a part mm -hmm. in 18th, 17th, 18th and 19th centuries mm -hmm. in the Rajput courts right. that a particular king, if he was very fond of Krishna mm -hmm. Shangar, the whole Krishna Shangar would develop in that I, I always wondered after looking at these marble pavilions in which Krishna and Radha are sporting. Where do they peg it in Krishna's story? Do they peg it in Mathura? What are oh. those pavilions? Because they cannot be Vrindavan. No, no, but there is no Vrindavan and Ritikarya. Yeah. No, no, understood. 
So, but somewhere they must peg it in the narrative of Krishna's story. You get it? The Riti Kavya, no, no, no. Riti Kavya is set in the courts, the Rajput courts. I get it. But and somewhere really? they must be linking it to Krishna's life, isn't it? No, no. No, no, no. no. It, has to, it has to find an expression no. somewhere. There is no Krishna's life. Mm -hmm. See, that is my theory. That is my the main point. Mm -hmm. That we are celebrating poetry here. Mm -hmm. Krishna Swayam Kavya. Mm -hmm. We are not celebrating Krishna and Radha as either historic yes. beings or kings or anything like that. Yes, but so far you moved from any incident in their lives, in their no, real no, lives. No, no, no. There I, I think what we have to say is that any poetry resonates with what must be going on. So they may have been a cowherd person playing the flute in love with the gopis and so on. So there could be resonances of what's going on in the world around. But as I said, that poetry must be understood by itself without bringing in any extraneous factors from us. No, I get all that. All I'm trying to say is that these painters in the Rajput courts were simply sucking up to whoever paid the bills by representing those courts in the pictorial... Picture. They were not representing courts. They were painting courtly imaginary scenes. Yes. So and, and those scenes, if you look at the... But they were painting Krishna and Radha. And they were painting, you know, but what they have done is they have completely done away with any episodes from Krishna Radha's life. They have simply conjured up yes. new episodes of set course. in palace conditions. Of course. So I, I find that really very yeah. It's an evolution, no? No, the whole Krishna Shangar evolves yeah, into an this evolution. courtly uh, <coughs> love at the time when all these Rajput kings were very strong. Did the Rajput kings see themselves as Krishna now do you think Sometimes they did. Sometimes they did. Yeah, Krishna yeah. 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 was painting himself blue. Yeah. 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 He always yeah. painted himself blue. Yeah. So yes, they thought of themselves so as him Krishna. Know, so like the Egyptian kings uh, as the king god, something of that sort? Absolutely. There was no question about it. So they identified themselves with Krishna. Uh, and as Savant Singh himself would do, the Savant Singh of Krishna. He called himself Krishna, Nagaridas, and Paditani uh, was, was, was Radha, as far as they are concerned. So they started thinking themselves as the king god uh, Krishna and Radha. So. And you see all that Islamic architecture coming in as well. Yes. The tombs and the arches. Yes. And yeah. 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 Now, I mean, this is only one small journey of Krishna. Uh, <laughs> what about the the entire poetic and the entire journey of paintings. That's a whole another journey. How the paintings started, how were they painted, who were the patrons, how did the styles change? The earliest paintings of Krishna from Gujarat, 15th, late 15th, early 16th century, shows Krishna with that peculiar eye coming out. It's called the farther eye. And the face is like this. And then the face turns as we get into Malwa, then into uh, Rajasthan, where the face turns full profile. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole art historical discussion there, maybe for another time, but yes. maybe through an art historian. Yes. They will tell you how this whole evolution took place. My interest is poetry mainly, although I'm also interested in paintings. But that's a, another very beautiful journey, how it goes from Gujarat to Malwa to Rajasthan, to all the Bahari kingdoms, also goes down to the Deccan a little bit, and so on. And the whole stories of the patron and the poets, and so on and so on. Many, many beautiful stories. My interest is fabrics and tapestry, so you just provided me great joy. <laughs> yes. And uh, there are people who have commented on what kind of clothes those Nayak and Nayakas wore, which we see in paintings. There's a person called Rahul Jain, who's a silk expert. And he can tell you what particular silk or fabric, whatever is shown in the painting. Uh, so he's an expert on that. So, And then there are people who talk about the color blue. We haven't spoken about that. What are the different blue colors that were created to paint Krishna? The earliest color was indigo, neel. 
then it was followed by Lapis Lazuli, and then it was followed by what's called ultramarine blue in the 19th century, which comes in a little tube. Mm -hmm. And how today's artists, a good artist today, will create that Ghanashyam. What colors does he or she mix? The, does he mix the blue with a little purple and a little black to make that Ghanashyam? You know, that's another good discussion. So much there. Marvelous. Thank you. Thank you.